Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. How many of y'all were here last night? Any? Oh, great. Terrific. Uh, I've just come from Occupy Wall Street. If you are, uh, when you get home tonight for the news, you'll see the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are, are there. Uh, I was reminded as I was there tonight that it was a member of the Writers Guild East, Patty Chayefsky, who wrote, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And, <laughs> and uh, so that was a very appropriate line this evening. I just want to remind everybody the usual drill about cell phones and any other kind of electronic devices to turn those off. I also want to say that if you uh, enjoyed tonight and enjoyed last night, that there's more of that where it came from uh, on our website, which is wgaeast.org, one word, wgaeast.org. Uh, we have a, a, a whole series of conversations called On Writing Online, and uh, there's some terrific people there, too, as terrific as uh, the panel tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of, of tonight's panel, who is a uh, erstwhile colleague of mine I haven't seen in a, in a long time. I'm so happy to see her tonight. Uh, she joined Entertainment Weekly in 1991 and became one of the magazine's two movie critics in 1994. Previously, she was a feature writer and columnist at the New York Daily News Sunday Magazine, and she has written for the New York Times Magazine, Vogue, and more, among other publications. Um, she's a member of the National Society of Film Critics and something uh, I hope to be one of these days, the past president, uh, <laughs> past chair, I guess it was in this case, of the New York Film Critics Circle, and she's also served on the selection committee of this very film festival. So, Lisa Schwartzbaum, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure, in turn, to introduce our panelists. Now, our subject, as you know, is New York as a character in writing. <coughs> New York, writing about New York, New York as a character. So as I introduce my lovely panelists here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they've written, and then we can get going. To my left, John Hamburg, uh, New York born. Uh, among his credits, Meet the Parents, co-writer on Zoolander, along came Polly, has a long uh, tradition of working with Ben Stiller. We will be talking about that. Next, we have Kevin Wade. Kevin Wade, I know you're born in Chappaqua. I've done my Wikipedia work. Um, uh, one thing that's interesting, uh, the great play Key Exchange, which is very much about it, very much New York set, and also Working Girl. There is nothing more New York-y than Working Girl and the Staten Island Ferry, and Made in Manhattan, so we will be talking about that. Then we have Shari Springer Berman, and she, of course, has written The Extra Man and American Splendor, she and her partner, John Pulsini. And then finally, at the end, we have Mark Heyman, he is the co-writer of Black Swan and has work in, uh, worked on a lot of Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky projects, so there's a little New Yorkiness in that, too. So I want to start, we were given this topic, this theme. One thing that strikes me is, what is the difference between New York as a backdrop that you just see the street and New York as a character that has a sense of playing a part in the story. And um, I can start with you, and if anybody else wants to jump in, then we can take it from there. Um, yeah, I mean, so New York as a, you mean, what's the difference sort of living here as opposed to Well, you know, there are, some, there are some movies you can see that New York is, it's supposed to be a New York street, or right. it's set, but there are some movies that pulse with New York, right. that, that the attitude is New York. Yeah, yeah, that you can always, I think usually you can tell, uh, I mean, you look at like a Sidney Lumet film, and it's New York. It's shot on the streets of New York, and there's just an energy, and, and there was a time where New York became so expensive to shoot in that you could see it was Toronto. You know, you always, I always look by the, the taxis in movies, and if you see a taxi, it's so easy to recreate a New York taxi, but they don't always do it, and I, you know, you would just know... That's not New York. And there's an energy and a pulse. I mean, I, um, I set a movie I wrote and directed, Along Came Polly, in New York, but the studio was like, we can't afford to shoot it in New York. So it was three days, two days in New York, and all the rest in Los Angeles. And as a New Yorker, I sort of prided myself on, I don't want it to look like one of those movies that takes place in New York, but shot not in New York. And, um, but, but, you know. but even more than whether it's shot in New York or Toronto, it's that in Along Came Polly, New York City was a piece of the story. Yeah. 
So that's what I'm interested in, in, in what it is that makes, how does a piece of, how does New York as a piece of the story shape the way you write something? Sure. Do you want to? I, I, I think that um, the moment you see, however you see it first, the skyline of New York or coming across the water or from above or whatever, it's, it's kind of three iconic uh, characters that it represents. One, which John mentioned, which is the gritty Sidney Lumet cop film, The French Connection, go all the way back to Warner Brothers gangster movies. The, the second is uh, longing or romance or, you know, uh, a sense of lost in a big city. It's the best place to tell a fish out of water story because everybody knows what New Yorkers sound like, supposedly, and that they're tough and they're this and that. And the third is that it, it represents a kind of uh, almost a, there's the haves and the have-nots. You arrive and you see Park Avenue and you see the Lower East Side and then very quickly in pictures you can start to tell your story without having anyone open their mouth. Sherry? Um, I actually grew up in New York, too. Yes, and, I meant um, to add that. Uh, and I, I actually like wanted to tell stories. I've done a couple of films, and I just finished a film that has a New York aspect to it that actually tell a story about New York uh, that I feel like hasn't been told yet. And this little movie we did called The Extra Man, I had read a book by a guy named Jonathan Ames who uh, does Bored to Death. I don't know if anybody watched that. And he's a New Yorker. And it told a story about these invisible New Yorkers. I felt like nobody has ever told a story about these people. And I actually had a great uncle who is subsequently passed away who was one of these people. And it's like you, you see these people walking around the street. Um, they're old. They live in apartments that they've been in for 100 years that they pay like $250 a month rent. Um, you know, it's like falling apart, but it's in like a good neighborhood, and you kind of hate them for it. And um, <laughs> but and my uncle had like a two-bedroom apartment in a brownstone that he paid, honestly, two hundred and fifty dollars a month rent. And um, and they kind of live on the culture, like they they're they're. Um, they come to free events. They my uncle would be in the library all the time. They're sort of. Um, and I see them as maybe people who came to New York to be something, and that thing never happened. And now they're kind of on the fringes of culture. And something about this book sparked that in me. And I wanted to tell that story. Um, and, and I guess so for me, like, when I wanted, and then I made a movie called The Nanny Diaries, which was based on a huge best selling book that, that, I actually did not have a child when I made The Nanny Diaries, which I think was a mistake, because now I actually have a child and probably would better qualify to make that film. Um, but, um, but, but it did tell a story about like haves and have-nots, which I find a very interesting thing also, having grown up, I grew up in a working, more working class aspect of New York, and now live in a less working class aspect of New York. So, it's those things, and I like very subtle things about New York that aren't big, broad strokes. And I feel like, as a New Yorker, I, I see that, and can tell tell those stories. Um, and it will always interest me to try to find, because I think New York is like the most amazing sort of character you can and 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 setting for a film. Mark, first first words. <laughs> um. Well, I'm the one non-New Yorker on the panel, I think, which puts me in a special position. But um, it's okay. I know New Yorkers aren't judgmental. Uh, <laughs> I, um, Black Swan's the only thing I've, you know, that's been finished and made that's set in New York. But like two of the three things I'm working on now are also in New York. And I think, for me, what's great about it, I mean, I have an, somewhat of an outsider's perspective still, so everything is still very new and exciting to me. Um, but I think I obviously traffic and kind of more thriller, sort of scary kind of stuff happening. And what's great about New York is that like, we're, we're all kind of somewhat unprotected at all times. And because we don't have our cars and our private space is much uh, harder to police actually. Um, and so for thrillers and stuff, stuff can happen very easily in New York, whereas in another city you'd have to kind of come up with a lot just to even get someone inside the house to like figure right. out the logistics of like, why is that person in the house? <laughs> whereas in New York, like stuff can jump out at you. There's <clears throat> like constantly that threat. And so if you traffic in paranoia, 
it's kind of the perfect city for that. <laughs> so between you and Darren, that would be a good combo of trafficking and paranoia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he certainly exploits it too, obviously. What was also interesting, just to pick up on Black Swan, is that you had there was a sense of eeriness and scariness, and it was also it was the underbelly of glamour. It was the backstage at the ballet. It was, it, Shari, similar to what you're saying, what's in the back, what the people that you don't see. Was that something that you uh, discussed with Darren as something that you needed to bring out? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I spent a long time actually here at Lincoln Center uh, before even writing, about three months hanging out at the Met. Um, and I think we did talk about certainly ballet as a world that is all sort of sheen and beauty uh, from afar. And then as soon as you get closer to it, you see the kind of bloody toenails and stuff like that. And so uh, I think New York has a similar quality where there is the sort of like parts of it that are very glitzy and shiny, but like right on top of the ugly parts. And they're not all that separable. Um, and everyone has to ride the subway at the end of the day. So uh, I think there is that nice sort of confluence of you know, grit with sheen. Do people speak faster in your New York scripts? Can, can you actually, can you create a character if he, if he or she is here? Do you find yourself writing in a different way for the voice of those people? Um, I mean, I certainly do. Just, yeah, I just think there's a way that New Yorkers speak, a cadence, a rhythm, uh, a directness that's very different from characters in who live in LA or the Midwest. Uh, so I, you know, I like when you write. It's easy when you're writing for Robert De Niro because he's such a New Yorker and he gets those cadences. But you know, you sort of base these characters on people you grew up with or you knew at family gatherings, and the you know maybe the relative who may have been involved in crime in some way, but he probably wasn't. He was just in the garment business. You mean my cousin Steven? Yeah, we all have one. Yeah, I mean, there's that guy. Um, so I just use all that, you know, all those people I grew up with. And, the, and just also spying on people on the streets, mm. uh, which is probably my favorite thing about being a New York-based writer. Um, you just pick up on, there's, there's ways that New Yorkers speak that I've never heard anywhere else in the world. Uh, and I like to exploit that for movies. You also can... Um, uh, if you're writing a New York woman, you can write her exactly like you'd write the man. You don't have to, you don't have to change anything, because it's like there's a certain uh, uh, code that, that everyone goes out with, and it doesn't have to do with gender. It has to do with, I'm going out into New York, and I'm going to get now that, work done. But now let's get then to, um, to Working Girl, if that's the case, because from the very opening scene, you have Melanie Griffith on a ferry, coming from Staten Island, getting ready to take on the world. Right with Carly Simon singing in the background. I mean, that sums up New York in, in one scene and a type of, of woman. That's what you're talking about? Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly in that one, but in almost anything subsequently or before that, I just found that once I sort of figured that out, it became really fun to write women because you weren't writing women. You were writing, uh, here's a creature of New York City who was trying to get a foot further that day and wasn't trading on... Um, I'm always a little uh, 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 suspect when they try to put it like, well, a, a beautiful woman with certain wiles can get ahead in New York. And I'm like, maybe in Charleston, but not <laughs> New York. It just doesn't feel authentic. And uh, if, if you embrace that, it becomes really fun to write uh, not tough women, just women like, just like you'd write them like men. But is that more screwball, would you say? I mean... I guess. I mean, I think it's equal opportunity, <laughs> but I suppose it's somewhat screwball. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, as I say, talking about New York being a character, I think that's one of the characters of New York is the woman who can pound the taxi cab as she's going through the <laughs> intersection the same way a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking here. <laughs> Shari, in 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 writing the extra man and in in um, the Kevin Klein character, who this was Upper East Side. Right. Uh, but a sh like um, genteel shabby, he was, as you, as you said. Did you walk around listening to people up there in order to get the tone? I actually spent a lot of time. I live on the Upper West Side, so it was a big journey. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I had to take the Crosstown bus. But it is like going to another world, I have to say. Um, Bob and I, my partner and husband, we would go in the afternoon and just walk around the Upper East Side 
And we did this for the, actually it was more shocking for the nanny diaries because <laughs> we actually had to like, we hung out at places where ladies who lunch, lunch, which I would never normally go to. And like Bergdorf Goodman and all these women carrying their little dogs, which is really popular at Bergdorf Goodman. <laughs> and um, it's amazing. Like honestly, I know you probably are all New Yorkers. One day, just go hang out on the Upper East Side. And just look at the people. Do we have to go across town for that. <laughs> Are you a West Sider? Yes. Too? Okay. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it, it's 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 amazing the way they dress, the way they. I mean, not everybody. A lot of people are just like regular, but they're every. <laughs> I'd say like every half hour, something jaw dropping walks by, and. Um, men in ascots and like you if you put it in a movie it would be extreme you people would say that's too much <laughs> and uh we just we just wrapped a movie a couple of weeks ago with Kristen Wiig and we shot a bit on the Upper East Side and same exact thing it was just amazing it hasn't changed there is still an incredible um just gallery of people walking around and the way they speak the way they dress we also um on Nanny Jars, we visited a lot of, um, I got people to, who I knew, friends of mine, people I knew who did well, whose parents had money, who allowed me to come and see their homes, which was incredibly fun, to like go into these amazing, because you can't tell from the street how big these apartments <laughs> are, but they go on and on and on and on, and they have like museum quality artwork on the walls, and. Um, so it was like great as a voyeur to check that out. Have you ever been told that's too New York? Have, have, has maybe a suit in LA said, this is not gonna translate for the rest of the country? You go. I, n the only thing that came to mind when you said that was uh, not, not really. I mean, I think most people, <laughs> Just go, um, they, they know what New York is, they've seen New York in movies, and many people in the movie business lived in New York and then moved out to Los Angeles. So um, no, the, the only thing that came to mind when you asked that question was there was a line in Meet the Parents uh, that I, I wrote a line for De Niro where he <coughs> says, he's saying to Ben Stiller, if you, you know, in my house, it's either my way or the Long Island Expressway. Uh, <laughs> not that funny a line, quite frankly, but just sort of <laughs> like a line that, a, guy trying to be funny might say, which was the intent. And the director, Jay Roach, grew up in Albuquerque and he was like, what the hell? I have no idea what this is. I was like, it's not funny, but he might say it. So, and so uh, it, 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 it is kept. in the movie, yeah. Also, again, because you, you work a lot with Ben Stiller, Mark, you work a lot with Darren Aronofsky. These are both strong collaborations because they're both, these, th those two guys are strong New York characters in and of themselves. What do you, Mark, let's start with you. What do you absorb from Darren as his kind of energy? Um, well, that would be a long therapy session. <laughs> uh, but everyone uh, here knows what that is. <laughs> right. No, I mean, he, you know, he was born and raised Brooklyn. His parents are really Brooklyn, like you know, Sheep's Head Bay, and uh, and our, and so. There's an energy in like a certain uh, neuroses, we'll call it, um, that definitely in terms of just like a speed of like everything's kind of fast um, and every, there's a certain impatience, I guess. Uh, but I don't know, I mean like on, on Black Swan in particular, um, to the degree that detail is, always, is very, very important to him in general. And then, like New York, like I remember getting into conversations about like which subway line would she have taken to get to that spot, and where exactly is she walking? Like, what block is she walking? Like, we'd get into very logistical conversations, uh, most like geographic, but otherwise, like, where's the club? What part of town is it in? Okay, so they're taking the cab, and like just figuring that stuff out, which no one cares about except for people in New York, Bry. Um, because when we see them go from, you know, the East River to. Chelsea, around the corner, then we say, mm -mm. Yeah. or if their address is, you know, 600 <laughs> West End Avenue, and you know they're in the Hudson. Yeah, so. <laughs> the alarm bells will go off. And so that stuff's important to him. And so we, and there is actually one kind of flub in the film that we tried to avoid, but it ended up in there anyway, which is uh, like very early on, she's riding the subway, 
and Mila's character gets out uh, before she does out of the other car. And then when Mila comes into the dressing room later on, she says, I fucking missed my stop. And I had writ rewritten that line to be, I fucking got off at the wrong stop, just to like match up. And then and other people were like, wait, if she lives on the Upper West Side, she wouldn't have missed her spot. She would have gone off a little early. And that's why she's like, <laughs> and that, you know, we tried very hard to avoid that. But some New Yorkers still And caught. that would be something that uh, Aronofsky would be concerned about? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, there was a scene, that scene where she's walking underneath the construction thing was originally in Central Park walking home. Um, but part of the reason, it changed for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was like, well, if she's at Lincoln Center and she lives on the Upper West Side, why would she be going into the park? Mm -hmm. And we kind of liked the park as a setting, but, and, but we couldn't ultimately justify it because it didn't make any sense. So we had to scrap it. Shari, with you and, and your husband and creative partner, he's also a New Yorker, right? He, he, has yes. been in New, he was born in New York, but he, his dad was in the Army, so he lived all over. Oh, okay. But he considers himself a New Yorker. Oh, but, but the two of you have been working together long enough to have the language of co-New Yorkers working Absolutely. together. So is there a shorthand language between you in your writing that, come, that you can identify as coming from here? Yes, it's called yelling at each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's very New York, actually. <laughs> it's exactly what you were saying about women being written like men. Um, sure. I mean, I have to say, I take the, like, I do, like, the Darren Aronofsky, like, I'm much more of a, you know, sort of critic about, like, wait a second, that nobody would ever do that, or you couldn't, you know, go cross town on that bus, or, you know, like, I definitely more than Bob, like sort of play that role of the ultimate like New York person. But I'm Jewish and Bob's Italian and his family is from Queens originally. So he kind of, he has like the whole Italian thing. He owns that and I own like the neurotic Jewish thing. So that's, we, that's our like split in Perfect. it. Perfect. <laughs> and then the, uh, the Stiller sensibility. Yes. Yeah, I mean... Um, therapy needed for that also? Ex yeah, okay. a lot of therapy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we clicked from the moment we met, I think, because we were both New York kids. We went to school here in the city, and m my mom is a radio talk show host, so she's not... She's sort of in show business, but, you know, we, I could relate to... How he grew up. Joan Hamburg. Joan Hamburg. Oh, yeah. oh you're, I know who your mom. Uh, I love your mom. I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. That's, that's my mom. Uh, so, um, yeah, people have either never heard of her or they or listen to her every day for 30 right. years. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so we related on that. And, and uh, as these guys have said, there's a, you know, there's a neurosis. Uh, you know, we're, that's what we carry with us. Um, I think I'm proud of that as a New Yorker. Most New Yorkers, I think we all share that. There's just, it's just a different world than uh, most other cities uh, in, in the world. Um, and, uh, and Ben and I just clicked in that way. And again, the, the rhythms that we each spoke with, it, it made it very easy for me to write a lot of characters for him because we just, he, he's a great actor and I can't act at all. But in my mind, I can sort of think of Ben Stiller and his cadences and his rhythms um, and write for him. And I think a lot of that is both of us being kind of New York kids. Could I, I just wanted, you had a question earlier about, did you ever get kind of a, a note that somebody was too New York-y? And um, I always took when I got a note that so-and-so wasn't sympathetic enough, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which you get a lot. And, and it meant that they're not cuddly, they're not accessible, they're not approachable, they're not malleable, they're not all these things that you don't want them to be if they're your protagonist. And these sympathy notes were also coming from some of the least sympathetic people you could ever meet, uh, studio executives based in Los Angeles. So I always took it as code for, uh, you know, it's too New York-y, it's a little too, it's not gonna play outside of your little burg there. And then did you soften? You'd throw a bone, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, you'd soften a little bit, you know. They'd be going to do something and you'd have them save a kitten. Or, you know, <laughs> do something just to get it out of the way. Very smart. <laughs> Very wise. Um, 
you, uh, we, we need to talk about, uh, I was mentioning to you uh, before we came out here, a certain movie about a, a politician who goes back to his hotel room and uh, comes in upon the maid who's cleaning right. up his uh, cleaning up his room, and you wrote about that years well, yeah, that before a, this a movie about ten years ago called Made in Manhattan. And uh, you did know, that feel very Made in Manhattan to you? The, uh, the, the movie. I, I saw the woman in the New York Post, and she you know she didn't look like Jennifer Lopez. No, well, I, I meant like, your movie. That did, the, did it feel New York? It felt fake New York a little bit to me. I mean, you know, it was it was a aimed at a certain kind of audience. There wasn't any sort of authenticity. It, it was, I think, a good example. And Wayne Wag d did a terrific job uh, creating this confection that was the the purpose of it. But it was it was interesting to me when I watched all the stuff about Dominique Strauss Kahn, because um, the research we did for that very quickly. If you go to these great New York hotels, somebody like him comes. Um, I'll, I won't use him, but a fictional example, because we did what, what the maids go through. Um, Mr. Smith is coming in on Friday. He's on the wagon, so clear out the mini bar. only fruit juices. Uh, he's also non-dairy, so no milk or anything. Uh, Mrs., um, the girlfriend's coming around midnight that night. The wife and kids are coming in from Chicago on the 2.30 flight on Sunday. Make sure they're out and that the room has been thoroughly searched. And they have actually gotten that this is, information. That's what they do. That's how a high-end hotel so when I saw all that stuff, I was like, they, they know. I mean, you know, it, 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 this, mm. this element of surprise didn't quite match up with the way that a leading hotel in a major city huh. like New York uh, treats a guest like that. I hope I won't get in any trouble. That doesn't leave this room. <laughs> <laughs> it's just among us. You mentioned fake New York, and one of the things I wanted to do is uh, like go down the line and say, What's the clue that it's a fake New York? What's the giveaway that it's not authentic? Start with Mark. Hmm. Like, what's besides the fact of turning the corner going from the east side to Chelsea or something? To me, to me, it's almost like a shot selection thing. It's like if there's too, if it's too wide a shot of people walking down the street, like if you can see the street too much, <laughs> um, that's a dead giveaway for me. There's some there's an inherent claustrophobia. Uh, that you, because the streets are tight and close together, except for certain exceptions. But for the most part, if you're in the middle of the city, if you see your characters walking, there's a huge amount of space around them, then they're not in New York. Shari? I would go with what you were saying about character, and it's about, like, it's about the personality. If, if people are, it, there's an, it, there's, if people are too nice, I think in a in a really like surf like the way people walk down the street in New York, it's it's people don't smile at each other. They don't look at each other. We're busy. Doesn't mean like if you're in trouble, New Yorkers won't be great and help you. But they're busy. It's it's actually about attitude. And you can see when a movie's been really fiddled with by. And I've gotten those same notes about sympathetic people are too mean. That when when it's been you know, the studio has come in and made it kind of generic people, not New Yorkers. And to me, that's the, I don't care about the shots, I don't care. It could be the most beautiful scenery you've ever seen of New York, but if, it's the way that people behave that really. Right. So. John, you have any, your giveaway that, oh, forget it, and it's not. Giveaway that it doesn't that take it, that it's, that it's that it's a That it's false. Um, well, I mentioned the taxi cabs, street lights, and, and um, like Shari said, the background actors, the extras, that's a biggie. You can really tell New York extras just have a certain look to them. They've just been doing it for a long time, and they're, it's just different from an L.A. extra where you're in sort of a pleasant environment. You're, the holding room is nice. In New York, they're on like a rat-infested alley waiting for eight hours to be called. They're in the cross. basement of the church next door yeah. to me because they're shooting it out on the street. Exactly. Right? They're yeah. just colder and hotter, and you can kind of tell. I actually I did a film last summer in L.A. I shot it all in L.A., and one of the things that drove me crazy, it was supposed to, it, the, the movie took place in 1971 through 1973 when there was no Botox, no, uh, <laughs> no teeth whitening, People had yellow teeth. I could, the extras, every single one of them had like surgery. They were really skinny. They, their teeth were perfectly white. And I was like, 
but in New York, you don't get that. Yeah. Like your background people, you have to like put them through some <laughs> cleanup operations. <laughs> I would turn it around then. Um, when you're watching, other than your own your own work and work that that your own stuff, when you're looking at a movie, when do you know it's got it right for New York? And or, what's your favorite New York movie? Mm. Discuss. Think. <laughs> I think I think one thing that that and it's really parochial, but when they get it right is when people are going to meet for a very romantic drink and it's at Bemelman's Bar. Mm. Or they're going to go to have a certain kind of, um, I, I want this, and they're in Katz's Deli. Or if you really use New York, whether, if, if you're from somewhere else, you just see, oh, Katz's Deli, and it's what, old neon, and that's kind of cool. But if you're from here, you go, yeah, it's exactly where they've got. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or if you're, you know, so going out from there that you may, I mean, Woody Allen did just, it yeah. better than anybody. He, it was his backyard. He, in his head, this is where it is, and because he was who he was, and he had Bob Greenhut, he, he yes. got that place, you know. Yeah. So I think to me, that's it: is is using New York authentically. Any anything else pop to mind here? Well, I would say, you know, to me, there's a danger in films trying to be New Yorky uh, that can happen too, which is and for example, well, meaning that like. It's such a setting that it's just drawing a lot of attention to itself and everyone's speaking with a certain kind of accent and like all of the places they go to eat are the landmark places and like and to me like what's great about Woody Allen films and all you know and and people that are really from here is that there's like a sort of a taken for granted sort of like it, it flows seamlessly in the environment. It doesn't feel like it's trying to like make New York this really, really big character. To me there's something false about that too because I think the experience of living here is much less like poppy wow like oh my god it's New York all the time it's like you fold into your specific neighborhood so if you see a film where like every scene is around some landmark or some big thing there's something a little bit eye rolly about that too I mean it would be something like I mean Law and Order has all of New York City everywhere in every place and it's not the story but it's it's it seeps into the story yeah did you have something you wanted yeah, to Yeah, I mean, for me, just, um, I mentioned Sidney Lumet yes. earlier, you know, no, and he, him, yeah, he just was, to me, the ultimate New York filmmaker. I mean, he made like 50 movies or something, and maybe 75% took place in New York, and he just shot everywhere, and, and um, just, it, it was just so real. Dog Day Afternoon uh, just could not have been set anywhere else but New York, and you watch that again, it's just like uh, such a a moment in time in the city that doesn't exist anymore. So for me, he, he, he and Woody Allen are the two guys who are the ultimate, just they capture what it is to, to live in New York, to be on the streets like we're talking about. And, yeah. yeah. And at 1970s New York or taking a Pelham 123 oh, yeah. New York yes. or something, Charry, you're talking about people whose teeth is, aren't perfect and everyone looks sweaty and ratty and... I mean, part of the problem, and I'll let other people speak to this, Please. but I think New York is less New York than it used to be. Well, and a lot of talk the, about yeah. that, because this a ties into it. Films, yeah. I, it's hard to even make those films, at least set in Manhattan anymore, because um, that kind of, that aspect, the sort of gritty, whatever you want to call it, is kind of gone, certainly from Manhattan. Which was part of right. last night's yeah. conversation, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And so what, what do you do? What, what do you, as a screenwriter, and what do you, working with your the rest of the filmmakers do to bring that back? Uh, I mean, when you, but when, like yeah. when you did Black Swan, right. that had, and I, I mean, it's not gritty, uh, you know, Needle Park, New York, it's not, but, but it had a sense of Yeah, underbelly. well, we were dealing with a different reality that was more guidepost than, than the city, which is ballet, obviously. So mm -hmm. we had that as our guidepost and, and certainly dug as deep as we could into that, <laughs> uh, which gave us our grit more than the city itself, I think. Um, it, most of that film is inside. Right. Shari, did you have... Did you no, I, I, I actually think that, you know, that's the story then. Is, you know, I, I've been lately, I've been a little bit obsessed with, because like the Chelsea Hotel, I shot in the Chelsea Hotel for that movie I shot 
uh, last summer, this movie, Cinema Verite. And I, like, to me, that's like this amazing New York location. And it's just closed. And it's going to be renovated. And God knows what they're going to do to it. And, um, and I, you know, CBGB, so, so many places. And I've been obsessed with this idea of New York. There's an E.B. White book that he wrote called Here this is, is, this is, New, this York. is New York and and he's like bemoaning how New York has changed and it's in the 40s right. <laughs> and my mom grew up in New York my mom grew up in in the East Village and I as a kid I would grow up hearing my mother complain about how much the village has changed and so I guess there's an aspect <clears throat> of the fact of New York constantly evolving and being it isn't the Sydney Lumet New York which is the New York like I have a tremendous amount of affection for that New York because that's like I was watching the opening scene from Shaft and New York is so dirty and disgusting and I'm like that's my New York you know and it's like that's that, but that's my New York that's not like maybe the story is in Williamsburg or the story is in Bushwick or it's not Manhattan or maybe the story in Manhattan is about Manhattan becoming suburban you know it just to me as hard as it is for me to say goodbye to these things that are my sort of signposts of my youth I just think that New York is an ever-changing organism and that's what keeps it vital and you know that's that's what you have to work with I'm old enough to have seen Midnight Cowboy in Times Square when it came out. Yeah. And if you saw Midnight Cowboy in Times Square when it came out, you left Midnight Cowboy, it looked exactly like it was in the movie. <laughs> and it was even kind of in black and white. You know, wow. it, yeah. Times Square in the, in, at that time, was I was in high school, but I used to come into New York. Anyway, I think now if you're going to, if I was going to write a story about, you know, a, a, an ambitious young kid comes to New York and he's going to make it here, He'd be living in Carroll Gardens, <coughs> and that looks like the village. And it's the same restaurants and the same people on the street. And, it's, and, and if a young actor moves here, he moves to, they call Astoria, Actoria now, <laughs> because that's where all the young actors are going. So that New York just has to be more largely embraced. And because I work on a cop show now, we, sh we, we go out at, more into the boroughs a lot of times. And there's just a lot of, you know, that New York just isn't Manhattan anymore. It's, it's always being pushed out. Right, which gets back to the haves and haves nots that, that we were talking about earlier, too, because the boroughs is, yes, anyhow, go on. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, I just shot in Broad Channel and mm -hmm. the Rockaways, and that, like, Sidney Lumet could totally shoot at. Mm -hmm. It's all cops and firemen, and it's yeah. totally, like, you don't even believe, and it's, you can get there on the subway. But it's so not what you would think of as New York. So it's there. You just have to seek it out. To switch fantasies of New York or gears of New York, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to talk about was sex in the city as what did it do to New York? What was positive about how bus tours now come by and want to, you know, people line up for cupcakes and want to see where Carrie lived. What's the plus of it and what's the minus of what Sex and the City did to the perception of New York? John, start uh, with you. <laughs> wow. Um, the plus of it is that um, my wife watches it almost every night, so that's, she, it's entertaining to her. Um, I mean, I live in the village, so you're not going to get a lot of pluses of what it's done for me, because it's like, you're walking in the West Village, and it's just, you don't want to see bus tours. It's just, that's, the West Village was a neighborhood that was like our secret of these weird streets that didn't, weren't on the grid system, and um, yeah, and, and I remember... Magnolia Bakery before there were lines around the block and they had one in near Rockefeller Center and so um, I think it it you know it was a fantasy it was a fantasy of New York and it was a really funny charming show uh, that I wish didn't take place in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin? You know I, I, I didn't watch it much I was aware of it and, and, and uh, uh, I've worked with Darren Starr um, it, it seemed to me it, it was the New York of Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm. Um, it is a fantasy of New York. It's a fantasy that you could work that little and live that way. <laughs> but that's okay. Holly Go Lightly got away with it. And in some ways, they were all versions of Holly Go Lightly. They kind of depended on the kindness of strangers or men in some ways. And I thought it was a very nice fantasy about a particular little tribe in New York. And it obviously attracted, it, there, there was an aspirational thing that it grew to be. Um, I, I don't aspire to it personally. <laughs> but, you know. I, I wasn't like 
I didn't really watch it that much. I, I kind of don't like the way it made people dress. I feel like it, 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 like I actually feel like one of the great things about New York is that people actually don't dress up that much. You know, it's, it's, it, they dress okay, they dress well, but they're not all about labels, they're about s personal s s sort of statements. And like as a woman, I, I felt very like, you know, the pressure of the way these women dress, which was a way I would never, ever, ever dress. And I don't think anyone in New York would ever dress, right. you know, usually dresses like that. So that was my big complaint. Do you think that people actually think New York is like that? Yes. Yeah, you do. It would be fun to see their faces when they get here. <laughs> <laughs> so besides coming here for cupcakes and to see Carrie's house or where Mr. Big lived, they expect New York, you think they expect Manhattan to be looking like this, which brings us back to shooting in the boroughs. And <laughs> well, it, you know, Manhattan can look like that. It takes some money. And so, the, I mean, if you just go even to television, the, another television, The Apartment on Friends. I mean, it, it, an absolutely charming yeah. show, but it's incredibly removed. But that's okay. It, it's entertainment. But I don't think anyone looked at Sex and the City as a documentary. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying, but I think it really did have an effect of a certain kind of New York. As, as we're saying, Woody Allen had a, yeah. has an effect. I mean, Woody Allen now, I mean, tourism is up in Paris because of him, yeah. Ameri right. and, and it's, the same, it's the same thing. It's selling a certain kind of look, but since that lasted for a number of years and had... had uh -oh. Thank you very much for coming. Right. <laughs> 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 Is it me? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the romanticizing of New York is, is what we... But, but, I, but I, it's, it, you know, we tend to say we live on a small island off the coast of America, right. and... So does, how is New York perceived beyond, and is this something that you need to pay attention to in your writing, since you are writing not only for New Yorkers, but for a national and international audience? So that, actually, we can move the question to that. What's the question? Ah. <laughs> the question is, when you're writing about New York, how much do you have to keep in mind that there are people not from New York who need to understand what's going on? Ah. Um, which is not quite the same thing as make them nicer. I mean, right. it, 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 there's that also, yeah. but... Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's always... I mean, whether it's New York or really anything in a story, there's that... There's the, the pooling sort of tug-of-war between authenticity and then exposition of some kind. Um, and, and I think it's true no matter what whether it's the background of the characters, the setting of the story, the logistics of like being a scientist or whatever it is, where the reality is it's like, let's say it's set in a hospital, the doctors would very rarely like really explain what they're doing um, because they'd know it and it would be understood and there'd be, and, and yet the audience isn't gonna be, have medical training or isn't gonna be from New York. So I think that there's always that tension between needing to like fill people in and certainly this was true of the dance in Black Swan in terms of trying to educate people enough about that uh, without doing it so much that it starts to feel fake and doesn't feel like it's an authentic world so I, I think that that's true of New York but I think it's true of everything and I struggle with it basically no matter you know whatever the element is and Sharon, writing again I come back to thinking of the extra man which is also so much depends on New York as in the story that Jonathan Ames told and also in the way that you turned it into a film. Are you, do you feel that um, tension between wanting to write New York and needing to write for everyone else? Um, I, I probably don't think about it enough. You know, I, I, I guess I believe that people should be aspirational and try, like I saw movies that I knew nothing about and then it made me want to go read books or see movies that explain to me what it was about or talk to other film, I mean like David Lynch, who's a filmmaker who I'm really you know, influenced by and who I admire, will never even talk about his movies. Because mm. his whole thing is like, I'm not gonna tell you, you need to think about it and talk about it. And it, it's funny because um, I, like years ago, I, I had a, an old boyfriend who was from Wisconsin and I remember we saw a Woody Allen movie where, uh, I believe it's Diane Keaton is like ordering 
tons of food at a, uh, she's ordering, she orders a, with a glass of milk. Right, right, like a turkey sandwich on mayonnaise, with mayonnaise on white bread with a glass of milk. And he thought it was like the funny, and you know, everybody laughed in the audience in New York because they know that that's like a disgusting thing that no, <laughs> like New Yorker, let alone a Jew, would ever order a drink. And he thought it was really funny and he laughed. And I was like, can you tell me why you think that's funny? And he said, because you ordered so much food. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, you got that joke wrong, but you laughed, so it's okay. You know? And to yeah, me, it was yeah. like Woody Allen didn't try to make any of his references understandable to people who were from Wisconsin, but yet they laughed. You know? So I guess that's my philosophy. Did you have... No. I, don't, no? I don't know that I have much to add to this. I mean, it's a movie like Zoolander, which... We, we did, which takes place in New York. You know, that was like a satirical version <coughs> of, New, of New York. And that is fairly, I've met now sort of some male models who were like, God, that, were, that was almost like a documentary. Of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I mean, you know, I didn't do any research, nor did Ben. I think Ben went to some fashion shows, but, um, you know, we just sort of said, you know what, I bet models like, It'd be funny if they crashed in the same loft together, and they were like, "Oh, yeah, that's so accurate. We all live together, and you know, that's have bunk good. beds." And, and uh, <laughs> so anyway, that wasn't. Uh, we weren't that worried about it being insular. Um, then maybe in a way, doing satiric New York is New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was close. I mean, there, it, we wrote about at the time the hot club was Mumba. Uh, which I could never get into, and nobody I knew could get into except for Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson. Um, but, you know, we had this joke that it was like, it was so hard to get into that th at the VVVIP room, it was only Winona Ryder. In there. Um, which I don't think is that far from the truth, actually, exactly. at the time. <laughs> it, it, does, it does allow you to be extreme. Yeah. I, I saw, recently I saw... Um, Friends with Kids, Jennifer Westfeld's oh, yeah. film, and she has a line in it where they're having a conversation and one character says to, to the other, did you know Ollie's closed on Broadway and 83rd <laughs> Street? And I thought, I know that, that's my, you know, I mean, it was so specific and I, and I maybe like your friend in Wisconsin, it would just be, ooh, Ollie's, that's a funny name. Right, exactly, <laughs> they'd laugh at that and feel really sad, but <laughs> us Upper West Siders miss Ollie's. <laughs> but there's an Ollie's to go now. Oh, I know, because <laughs> I live around the corner. <laughs> um, uh, some final thoughts on being New Yorky and writing New York. Um, have you ever wanted to write an entirely, you, you know, write a guy from Rajasthan or, or, or take on the German police and write something based like that? And how is that, how's that working? Not that anyone would ever pay me for. <laughs> so uh, I've always liked writing, I, I, if I look at it, I've wrote plays and I, I, whatever I've written has ended up here. Um, I think uh, it, it helps you a lot. It does some work for you. Um, uh, there's an iconic quality and a romantic quality that if you choose to license it from the city of New York, <laughs> um, y you can get a lot of mileage out of it. And I, I, not just romance, but, you know, John's been talking about, like, Sidney Lumet films. I mean, Serpico is one of the great uh, uh, hero movies of all time. I don't think it's as, although it's true, and that's part of the reason, but it, it, it's, it's great also because of its New York setting and, and what he goes through in a very specific way. So I think it goes back and, you know, decades worth of film that have licensed from New York and given back to it. And, but uh, but in, in exchange, you haven't felt the desire to, I don't know, do a Russian caper or... or no, I'll leave that to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Shari, you're so grounded in New York and it's so much a piece of you. Have, have you experimented with going beyond? Well, the first film that I made was American Splendor, which was about Harvey Picar, who, yeah. believe it or not, is not, not exactly. I mean, it, it's Cleveland, but he should be. He is a hard, he was, I'm sorry, he's passed away. Yes. He was a hardcore Clevelander. He lived for Cleveland, but he had a New York attitude. So, and Joyce, his wife, has a real New York attitude. So, there, so I connected to that. So it didn't have to geographically be in New York. I mean, the minute... Bef when Bob and I, when Ted Hope came to us with the project, 
He said, I want you to meet Harvey and Joyce first because you might not want to do the film after you meet them. <laughs> and, you know, and they might not want you. Like, it's about connecting. And we got along perfectly. And Harvey said, I feel really comfortable with you guys. I feel like we understand each other. So even though it wasn't geographically New York, um, I, it you felt that way. Yeah. Although I was miserable living in Cleveland. <laughs> um, and, and that being said, I, I did a film last summer in LA, which I spent a fair amount of time in, and I'm equally miserable there as well. Um, so but you are a New Yorker. <laughs> I am one of those New Yorkers who doesn't like to not be in New York. Right. Um, but I have to say, the thing about the thing about um, LA, because Bob and I, before we were made features, we did documentaries, and we made like series of documentaries about LA. Um, we did one about a restaurant called Chasen's. We would, did one about a cemetery called Hollywood Forever. So all these like sort of LA stories. And there was something about making these, we were like film students. We were actually still in film school. And it was like Alice in Wonderland. Like we were going out to LA and trying to get work and trying to understand this place that we were living in. So there was something really fun about making a film as an outsider. And maybe you had that experience on you know, writing about New York, that you sort of have these fresh eyes and you're just trying to understand the culture and uh, there's something great about that too. Mark, you want to talk about how it, anything read, resonate with you on this? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be, um, it would be very overwhelming to take on something that was internationally set, I think, personally, but I think it would be a lot of fun. Or Wisconsin set. Yeah. Well, that, that feels less so for me because to me, I always struggle with artifice. And as soon as you have people speaking English, but in that, I, like, I would sort of short circuit at that point. <laughs> but um, I think I would need to go to that place and be there for a while because I'm very nervous about getting things wrong. And I think being in New York makes you that way because everyone's so proud of their relationship to authenticity and knowing the best way to get somewhere and the right best high place in your neighborhood and everyone's very very you know very <laughs> excited about that sort of thing so it's made me sort of neurotic too about making sure you have the details right so I would have it'd be very scary for me to take on a story set in Cleveland unless I could write it from there and like be there for a year or however long to actually feel like I understood yeah. Sherry, did you write it? Th did <laughs> you? Don't want to do that. Did you write it. it there? No, no, I wrote it in my apartment in New York City. But, but I had Harvey's com like a, like a lifetime's worth of comics to base it on, and 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 Harvey is the master <clears throat> of authenticity. I mean, his whole thing was everything is fake. He hates everything that's fake. So I did have this great, you know, resource. Um, and and I have to and I, I tried to get Harvey to read the script to tell me if there were things that were fake, but he like didn't read the script. <laughs> he honestly was just like I, I don't want to read it. <laughs> I don't care <laughs> as long as I get paid. That's what. Um, <laughs> and maybe he read it and he was okay with it. But um, but so you know we just had to we did spend some time in Cleveland with Harvey before we wrote and he took us on tours and stuff. But uh, no, we didn't spend a lot of time there. So for our final, 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 you can give me either your favorite line of dialogue that's New Yorky or one scene that sums it up. Mm. Think. <laughs> that's that's really no? hard. Well, I mean, you, so if you were mentioned, yeah. somebody mentioned um, I'm walking here, Dustin Hoffman and Midnight <laughs> Cowboy. I think you mentioned right. it. And that is, I mean, I've literally, I love that movie. You know, I love Dustin Hoffman. And I've, I, that thought goes through my head a hundred times a day. <laughs> Just not, you know, especially now there's so many bikers. You're like, and you go, oh my God, I am a cliche. I am Ratso Rizzo now. Um, curmudgeonly guy walking around New York. Um, that, that's a pretty New York line that could only really happen in this town. Uh, at the end of the apartment, Jack Lemon uh, running full tilt through the streets, getting up to Shirley MacLaine's apartment with all the love in his heart, and she says, shut up and deal. <laughs> That's her kind of, kind of lady, too, in the, well, the characters. Just, yeah, it. it's, yeah. a great, it's a great New York ending to that story. I was going to say, you know, I read that 
that um, that whole I'm walking here was not scripted, that it really happened. <laughs> that, yeah. that Dustin Hoffman walked into the street, a cab mm. got through the lockup, and he just improvised it. Mm. So that's good, Mike. There you go. You go before me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. The first thing that popped into my head was that French connection car chase mm. for whatever reason, but that felt like it could only happen there and, and you know, the geography of that scene is so great. Um, that's kind of could only exist in New York, really. Broadcast news was is Washington, right? Washington. Yeah. Because yeah. every time I'm in a cab and telling the driver where to go exactly, I'm <laughs> Holly Hunter being that character. I think um, Woody Allen in um, Broadway, Danny Rose, when that device he uses where he keeps cutting back to the comedian, this sort of comic, and I guess there are they're like low rent agents and whatever sitting around at at um, the de uh, the Carnegie like Deli, yeah. yeah, eating and talking, and <laughs> it's shot really handheld, and something about that is like just totally perfectly New York to me. All right, get out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to our panel. Thank you.